Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jan Johnston. This presentation addresses the complication of contrast-induced nephropathy, its diagnosis, long-term sequelae, pathophysiology, risk factors, and risk reduction strategies. This presentation is based on an article published in a March 2007 supplementary issue of the Patient Safety Advisory. It is available on the website of the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority, which is responsible for the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Reporting System, or PASERS. Over the past 50 years, this complication has had no consistent name or definition. For example, it has been called contrast nephropathy, contrast nephrotoxicity, contrast agent nephropathy, radio contrast induced nephropathy. But these terms refer to the same entity, which in this presentation will be called contrast-induced nephropathy, or CIN. Today, CIN is most commonly defined when either of the following occur within 48 hours after contrast administration and persisting for two to five days. A 25% increase in serum creatinine, or SCR, concentration from baseline value, or an absolute increase in SCR of at least 0.5 milligrams per deciliter. CIN has generated increasing interest over many years for several reasons. It is the third most common cause of hospital-acquired renal failure after hypotension or decreased renal perfusion and major surgery. Long-term sequelae are associated with CIN. The scope of interventional radiology has expanded tremendously, resulting in increased use of image-guided interventions as alternatives to open procedures for serious conditions. Recent studies suggest that CIN may be prevented or its severity reduced. In the United States, the incidence of CIN has been reported as approximately 150,000 annually. How is CIN diagnosed? CIN usually is non-oliguric, so urine production may not decrease. Generally, physicians diagnose CIN by comparing SCR concentration before and after contrast administration. However, SCR is not necessarily an accurate reflection of true renal function because it is affected by several factors, such as the patient's muscle mass. Moreover, the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, can be reduced by more than 50% before an SCR elevation occurs because there is a nonlinear relationship between SCR and the GFR. Because of this and the fact that SCR is not measured routinely, cases of CIN may be overlooked and underreported. Patients with CIN have more serious outcomes compared with patients who do not develop CIN. Fortunately, fewer than 0.5% to 2% of patients developing CIN require dialysis. However, up to 30% of such patients may experience chronic renal impairment. CIN may also be associated with an increased risk of death independent of other risk factors. The average hospital length of stay for patients developing CIN can be prolonged from two days to more than three weeks, increasing medical costs. The pathophysiology of CIN is complex and not fully understood. A variety of factors may act together to promote acute renal failure. Initially, the injection of iodinated contrast media increases osmotic load, which produces vasodilation. This is followed, however, by a prolonged period of renal arterial vasoconstriction, which leads to renal medullary ischemia. Intrinsic mechanisms appear to be twofold. Contrast media produces changes in renal hemodynamics, as well as direct renal tubular toxicity. In healthy patients with normal kidney function, the structural and functional changes produced by contrast media are usually of no consequence. However, patients with the following risk factors may develop CIN in response to intravascular administration of contrast media. Pre-existing impairment of renal function is the most powerful predictor of CIN. Patients with both renal impairment and either type 1 or type 2 diabetes mellitus are at higher risk for CIN than patients who have pre-existing renal impairment alone. 
taking other nephrotoxic drugs such as NSAIDs, antineoplastics, furosemide, or oral sodium phosphate bowel cleansing products during the periprocedural period when iodinated contrast is administered also increases the risk of CIN. Several conditions that reduce effective intravascular volume, including hypotension or class 4 congestive heart failure, also reduce renal perfusion, thus enhancing both the ischemic insult to the kidneys and the risk for CIN after contrast administration. In dehydrated patients with nephritic range proteinuria secondary to multiple myeloma, High amounts of protein in tubular lumens combined with contrast material may cause obstructive nephropathy resulting in renal insufficiency. CIN risk increases in patients older than 70 years of age because they are more likely to have a reduction in renal mass, function, and perfusion. Generally, a decrease in CIN incidence is associated with lower osmolality and a lower dose of contrast media. CIN risk increases when high-risk patients receive multiple injections of contrast within a short period. Intra-arterial administration of contrast media poses a greater risk of CIN than intravenous administration. Conditions that damage kidneys increase the risk of CIN, such as sepsis, in which bacterial toxins and circulatory impairment can cause direct damage to renal tubules. Other conditions may be indicators of renal damage, such as a solitary kidney, history of structural kidney disease, or albuminuria. Coronary angiography followed by bypass graft intervention and percutaneous coronary interventions have been associated with CIN, but they are most likely reflections of contrast load and the underlying medical conditions for these procedures. The incidence of CIN and the need for dialysis is greater when multiple risk factors are present. While not a risk factor for CIN, severe and even fatal lactic acidosis can develop as a complication of metformin treatment in the presence of acute renal failure. Therefore, metabolic acidosis can result if renal function declines after administration of contrast. This complication has almost always been observed in non-insulin-dependent diabetics who had impaired renal function prior to contrast administration. There is currently no treatment to reverse or ameliorate CIN once it occurs. To date, there is also no single intervention that has been conclusively proven effective to prevent CIN. However, some strategies may reduce its incidence. The first step is to identify those people who are at risk. Calculating an estimated glomerular filtration rate, or EGFR, incorporates the SCR into a more accurate indication of renal function, rather than using the SCR alone. See the article for further details. History taking, using a standardized questionnaire, can promote consistency in identifying patients at CIN risk prior to a contrast-related procedure. Risk scoring schemes have been developed in an effort to predict CIN risk. While they may potentially be useful in clinical practice, further study is needed. A standard protocol to assess CIN risk can be developed similar to the safety checklists or questionnaires used in MRI departments. After a full risk assessment, conducting a risk-benefit analysis can determine whether a contrast-related study is essential in high-risk patients. For high-risk patients, consider alternative diagnostic procedures that don't require the use of iodinated contrast media, such as sonography, MRI, or CT, without contrast. Gadolinium-based contrast media were once considered a safe alternative for high-risk patients but recent clinical reports raise concern about renal tolerance of these agents. If feasible, when an iodinated contrast media procedure is necessary in a high-risk patient, delaying the procedure to medically optimize the patient's renal function prior to the procedure may reduce the risk of CIN. Hydration supplementation is the most widely accepted preventive strategy. Intravenous infusion of isotonic crystalloid is effective. Normal saline is generally administered for several hours before and after contrast-related procedures. 
infusion of isotonic sodium bicarbonate solution before and after contrast administration may be more effective than saline in reducing the incidence of CIN. But larger multicenter studies must be performed to determine its true efficacy. Another effective prevention strategy involves discontinuing nephrotoxic drugs during the periprocedural period. Such drugs are usually withdrawn 24 hours or more before contrast administration in high-risk patients when medically feasible. Use of low osmolar and isoosmolar contrast media may reduce the likelihood of CIN, as well as using the lowest possible volume or dose of iodinated contrast. A formula can be used to limit the volume of iodinated contrast in high-risk patients undergoing coronary angiography. If multiple contrast-related studies are necessary, allotting adequate time between studies will allow the kidneys to recover. Intravenous administration is preferred, except in patients with congestive heart failure. Many drug interventions studied to prevent CIN are based on attempts to improve renal blood flow or to block mediators implicated in CIN development. For the most part, these drugs have either had no effect or were actually detrimental to renal function, such as furosemide or mannitol. The few drugs that have evidence positive results have also yielded conflicting findings in subsequent studies. To date, no one pharmacologic agent has had consistently positive results in preventing CIN. Studies, and in some cases systematic reviews or meta-analyses, have yielded positive findings for the drugs specified, and some may judge their effectiveness adequately demonstrated. Combining different antioxidant compounds, such as sodium bicarbonate infusion and oral NAC, may provide an additive effect in preventing CIN. See the article for a more detailed discussion of these medications. Patients with severe renal impairment prior to contrast-related procedures may develop acute renal failure that must be treated with dialysis. While hemodialysis removes contrast media, many studies indicate that hemodialysis provides no prophylactic value in reducing either the incidence of CIN or its long-term outcomes. On the other hand, hemofiltration for several hours before and after contrast injection has shown promise in reducing the risk of CIN. It is reserved for patients with severe cardiac and renal dysfunction if the baseline SCR is greater than 4 mg per deciliter. Hemofiltration is further described in the article. In patients with normal baseline renal function, Metformin-containing drugs can be discontinued the day of the study. In patients with abnormal baseline function, such drugs are stopped prior to the study. In all cases, the drug may be restarted no earlier than 48 hours after contrast administration, once the patient's renal function has returned to baseline. Following the contrast-related procedure, physicians evaluate the renal function in high-risk patients for diuresis and compare an SCR 24 to 48 hours after contrast exposure with the baseline level obtained before volume expansion prior to contrast administration. If CIN occurs, daily SCR levels are performed until renal function returns to baseline levels. While the SCR is elevated, avoid further insults to the kidneys, such as additional contrast studies or drugs that alter GFR, such as ACE inhibitors or diuretics, if medically feasible. Institutions can benefit from developing pathways or algorithms to identify patients with risk factors for CIN and standardize prophylactic approaches to contrast-related procedures for high-risk patients. As in all clinical situations, the decision to administer iodinated contrast is based upon clinical judgment founded upon the clinical status of the patient, knowledge of the risks and effective prophylactic measures, and the expected benefits of the procedure. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. We hope you'll find this information useful in your own facility. This presentation was developed as part of the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Reporting System. To learn more about PACERS and to find more information on this and other topics, 
visit the Patient Safety Authority website at www.psa.state.pa.us. For further details on any of the topics discussed during this presentation, refer to the source article from the March 2007 Supplementary Patient Safety Advisory.